Welcome. Thanks for coming out tonight. Um, my name is Paula Kastner and I am here to talk about healthier and allergy friendly baking. I want to thank the Southboro Library for having me in. I'm assuming if you're here then you're already a regular patron of your library. Um, but if you're not and you only came for this workshop then let me encourage you. The local library is your best friend friend. Um, we love libraries in our family. Every time we travel, that's the first thing we do is, where's the library? You know, go find the library on the Cape, you know, go find the library at Lake Placid. Um, because libraries offer so many things, you know, not just books for you to be able to take out and tapes and videos, but also programming and computer access. And so, um, so we appreciate you guys patronizing the local library. The way we're going to work tonight is I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Um, what brought me here and then I'm going to ask you all to tell me why you're here because it helps me to tailor our conversation as we go and at any point while we're talking feel free to ask questions to interrupt um, <clears throat> It helps the program to be a little bit more directed towards you. Um, so I live in Lancaster, Mass, which is Central Mass. It's not that far from here, about half an hour away. Um, my family was into food allergies and food issues before it became vogue. So when I was growing up in the 70s, my family had weird allergies, allergies to like tin cans um, and allergies to vinegar. And, um, and it wasn't as popular as now. So if you had these allergies, you basically just didn't eat certain foods. On the other side of my family, there's some diabetes issues. And so I actually have a cousin who died from diabetic shock. Um, and I also have two of my three children are on the autism spectrum where I have to watch the types of food that they eat and on my dad's side of the family they have what's called a leptin deficiency which if you're not familiar with leptin it, it helps to regulate sort of your hunger sensors and how fat is in your body and so on my dad's side of the family everyone's a little bit large a little bit round and <laughs> um, <clears throat> And so growing up, I knew that I needed to really watch my food if I didn't want to have diabetes, if I didn't want to be really, really large, um, and because I didn't want to die from food allergies. And so I've dealt with this for 45 years of my life. And then what's happened in the last few years, the rest of the world's been catching up to me. You know, all of a sudden, you know, there's a People are understanding food allergies. People are understanding that children with certain special needs need to have special diets. Um, there's a lot more concern about diabetes and heart disease. And so I started getting a lot of phone calls from friends and family, and I'd be spending hours talking to them, telling them how to cook. And so finally, a couple years ago, a friend of mine said, you know what, you should just go teach people this, and then you can get off the telephone. And so that's what I've been doing for the past two and a half years, is traveling around to local libraries in the state of Massachusetts and sharing some of what I've learned over the years because what I found is for most folks it's just having someone tell them this can work you know you can eat healthier you can have you know allergy friendly food that tastes good because what's the big fear the big fear is it's gonna taste bad <laughs> you know nobody wants to eat a bad dessert <laughs> you know you want your cake to taste good is it going to be the same that's the question I get all the time especially from parents who just found out that their children have food allergies and they're gonna be having a birthday party and they're like is it going to taste the same is their chocolate cake even if it has no milk you know no butter no flour no sugar you know will it still taste the same and the answer is yes it can taste the same. So I'm here to share some of my experience and my knowledge. Um, it would be nice, I'll go around, if you could just tell me your names and why you're here, whether it's for allergies or whether it's for just healthy in general or just out of curiosity or if your niece was in a brownie meeting. You know? <laughs> and, um, and then that way I can tailor our program. So would you like to start? So, yeah, I'm just waiting and I was just curious. Okay, well welcome. So. Um, Sandy Keys, uh, I was curious about what you were presenting, uh, but also we do have uh, one member of the family that has a food allergy, so... Which food allergy? Uh, dairy and eggs. Dairy and eggs, okay. Um, this might be some very helpful information. Okay. I'm Hal, I like to eat. Yeah, <laughs> we all like to eat. <laughs> and, you know, we have diabetes on my side of the family. Diabetes, yeah. Okay, well, welcome. Hi, my name is Beverly Weaver, and I'm lactose intolerant. I was very sick as a child. I was always at the doctors, and back then in the 40s and 50s, we didn't know. And then my granddaughter, who's 23, and has trouble with gluten, and she's dairy, has 
I'm Clark. My daughter is here for brownies. <laughs> but I'm also very curious and very interested. Well, you should take her a couple of brownies when it's time for you to go. So. And this is my brother. I'm Jenny. This is my brother, and he does bake, um, which is really nice. But I'm always curious to learn about how to eat better, more healthy. I'm not aware that I have any allergies. That's but good. Perhaps I do. I don't know. You'd know. Oh, okay. All right. You would not feel well. Okay. So, all right. Hi. Hi. Welcome. I'm Joanne, and I'm Hi, just Joanne. interested in healthy Okay, well, and if you just arrived, feel free to partake of some of the dessert. So I like folks to eat ahead of time because then when I'm talking, you know that I'm actually talking about something that I know, that I have credibility because you've already tried it and know that it tastes good. So, so this is the unhealthy thing. This will be dinner right now. <laughs> yes, well, and it's all good for you. Everything's high fiber, high protein, no white refined sugar. So feel free to indulge. So, Hi. I'm Richard. I guess I'm interested in eating healthy mm -hmm. and if there's no effort involved that's a bonus <laughs> so going. i can't promise no effort but i can promise that it's easier than people might think that it is so um so if you um have been here for a little bit um and i don't know how many folks can actually see the um screen um i have some of these figures here and the reason i have this here is because even if you don't have a health issue and currently need to eat healthier and don't have any food allergies, I still think it's important for you to think about this issue because one of the things that we've seen is that there's been a huge increase in diabetes, there's been a huge increase in heart disease, you know, stroke. Um, people are heavier than they've ever been in the United States. And so I think as a nation, we have a little bit of a crisis. And a lot of it is because we tend to be people of extremes, you know, in the United States. You know, either it's a supersized McDonald's or they're making everything fat free with ingredients that aren't natural, which then lead to all sorts of, of health issues. So it's worth us, you know, thinking about this. Um, do you want to go to Sugar Honey since... Um so this is my son Jonathan. He is my youngest and he is my tech support. He is my clicker. <laughs> my auto clicker. <laughs> so, um, so I always start with sugar. Um, Here's the thing, most folks have a hard time when I start talking about sugar because we as a nation like sugar. We like things that are sweet and we put sugar as a preservative in almost anything. If you are not a label reader, the next time you go to the grocery store, just start randomly picking up things. Things that you wouldn't think have sugar like salsa or spaghetti sauce or soup or crackers and you'll be surprised that they all have sugar in it um, and so here's the thing about sugar how many of you after you've eaten something that has sugar about half an hour to an hour later sort of crash and feel tired and lethargic and not so great and so um, most of us have that experience and for folks who don't understand what happens is sugar when it goes through your body the reason we have things like diabetes is because your pancreas and your liver they filter out toxins and so sugar getting filtered out means that your body treats it like a toxin um, and here's my thing about food food should be good it should give you energy. It should be your fuel source. It should energize you. And if you eat it and it makes you feel terrible, then you really shouldn't be eating it. You know, what is it giving to you? It doesn't give, sugar gives you nothing. It gives you no nutrients. You know, it doesn't give you energy more than that brief sort of sugar high that you get for, you know, half an hour. Um, and it has a lot of empty calories, you know. Um, not to mention it causes your teeth to decay. <laughs> No. And I don't know how many of you have um, paid attention to a lot of the studies. Apparently, what's happening with your teeth is what happens with the rest of your body. You know, they, they can predict basically who's going to have a heart attack or a stroke or things like that because of what's happening in your mouth. So you really want to take care of your teeth as well as, you know, the, the rest of your body. Um, but the biggest question people then ask me is, 
how do you get rid of sugar? How do you cook without sugar? You know, nothing's going to taste good. Nothing's going to bake well, you know, because sugar does a lot of marvelous things in baked goods. And just um, so you know, what's on the screen is also on in the handout. So um, you don't need to take notes, everything that's here. This is just so folks can have something visual. Um, and I also on the chairs are is my business card um, because when you lose the handout then you can use the business card to go to the blog site which has all the information and when you lose the business card you just have to remember pajama living that's the name of my blog is pajamaliving.com so um, I've made it easy for you so um, and maybe you're not like me but I will you lose the handout lose the business card but I'm gonna remember pajama living because it's an image of you know sitting around in your pajamas all day you know being comfortable so um, so you don't need to take notes so but if you do notice you'll see that sugar does a lot of things in your baked goods um, honey you're on the wrong screen you need to go back so um, and so um, it controls temperature, it helps with browning, it absorbs the liquid, um, it breaks up the gluten if you're using wheat products. And that's all things that you know are good for a baked good. Um, th the good news though is that even if you take sugar out, there are ways to achieve the same thing. Usually what I tell folks is if you really are addicted to your sugar, and you think that I don't know what I'm talking about and there's no way that you can get rid of your sugar, what I ask you to do is at least cut it in half because almost any recipe that you cook with uses more sugar than you need. You know, a cake will usually have like two and a half cups of sugar. You can go ahead and cut it to one and a quarter and your baked good will be plenty sweet and it'll still cook just as well um, as if it had the two and a half cups. Um, if you are willing to be a little bit more daring and to get rid of sugar altogether, um, some of the best ways to substitute for sugar are natural um, fruit and vegetable sweeteners. You know, pureed bananas, applesauce, I love to roast vegetables. If you roast um, squash and pumpkin and things, so I don't know if anyone tried the banana bread um, because the banana bread is just roasted pumpkin. And so, you know, the vegetables and the fruits have their own natural sweeteners. And if you roast it, it brings that sweetness to the surface and it has the fiber as well and all the vitamins and the minerals that you get from fruit and vegetables which is you know a, a nice thing to to add um, the other thing they have on the market these days is they have things like coconut sugar agave um, stevia these come from plants um, the same way that sugar does and I'm not advocating that these are a cure-all and they're better for you than sugar. What I am advocating is you can use a lot less of it. So for example, um, I don't know if anyone tried the baked apples. Um, if you were to look up a baked apple recipe or look up like apple crisp recipe, it calls for two and a half cups of sugar. That 9 by 13 pan, which had an awful lot of apples, you know, a big bag of apples, I used one quarter cup of agave. Very sweet. I yeah, one quarter cup. And so what happens is um, even though it's still a sweetener and it still, you know, can affect your system, if you've got one quarter cup in a 9 by 13 pan, you know, of apples, then the amount you're getting is negligible compared to two and a half cups of sugar in the same pan. Um, and so, so because sometimes people will be like, oh, well, you know, this is good for me. I can, you know, have a lot of it. No, all sweeteners are not that great for you unless it's a natural sweetener. And even if you have diabetes, you know you have to watch your fruit, you know, because even fruit sugars can send your glycemic index out of control. You know, we have to be careful with things like watermelon, you know, which are so sweet. And so, um, but what's nice is you can use so much less of it. Um, so I made um, like the raspberry oat bars. What I use for that is I use Palaner All Fruit. Um, I don't know if folks are familiar with this. It's one of the few jams on the market that's just actually fruit. Um, if you are not a label reader, I encourage you to be a label reader because what you'll find is that most jams and jellies on the market, the first ingredient is sugar or corn syrup, you know. Um, and so something like Palaner is nice because it's just the fruit. Um, and so the raspberry oat bars gets its sweetness from this jam. 
It's the jam that's in between the oats. And my kids will eat it for breakfast because it's oat crust with just jam and oat topping. So it's kind of like having, you know, oatmeal. And oats are really good for you because it's high fiber and high protein. Um, and that's one of the things too, that if you do have issues where you need to be careful about diabetes, you always want to minimize the impact of any sweetener on your body. Hello. And the way to do that is to counter it with high fiber and high protein. So things like oats, um, and a lot of gluten-free flours, um, sorghum flour, garbanzo bean flour, millet flour, they have a lot of fiber, a lot of protein, and they will help counteract the sugar. So if you are using a lot less, if you're using like a quarter cup of agave, and then you're using high protein, high fiber, other ingredients, then the impact on your bloodstream is, is negligible, um, and you don't have those crashes that you would have having you know, sugar-filled products and, and white flour. Um, the only thing that you need to know is that if you are going to remove sugar from your um, baked products, if you are using coconut sugar or stevia, you're fine because those are dry ingredients just like sugar is. But if you're using something like an agave, um, I don't know if you could tell because it's an empty bottle, but it's a liquid. And so what I have found in my experience, um, so that you don't have to experiment for yourself, is if you're only using something like a quarter cup or half a cup, you don't need to do anything to your recipe. It'll work just fine. But if you're making a large batch of something and you're going to be using like three quarters or one cup of um, agave, you might want to either decrease your liquid ingredients by a quarter cup or increase your dry ingredients by a quarter cup. And that's all you really need to do, and then your baked products come out just fine the way that you know you'd like them to. So, are there any questions about sugar, and about any of these products up here? There was supposed to be a law that's supposed to put in the added sugar content on something, but that got postponed. Did the did new labeling was supposed to say like like natural sugar, but then we added so many tablespoons of sugar just to make it sweet, but that got postponed, I think. Yeah, I'm not really up on all the regulations. Um, I do suggest that people should be label readers, you know, to see. And I do know that, um, at least in Massachusetts, we're a very progressive state. So in Massachusetts, um, um, it doesn't surprise me that they, you know, are, are wanting to add more things because we've added a lot more things to labels um, over the years so that people would know about the trans fats and, um, you know, things like that. So, but certainly, you know, for folks who do have diabetes, um, it would be very helpful to know what the added sugars are. Um, I mean, you have to be careful because what we do have on labels is a lot of things now say no added sugar. And what they mean by that is no added white refined sugar, but they've added sugar substitutes like maltitol um, and sucralose and things like that. Um, and you can choose what you want to do, but this is my personal philosophy. If the warning label on maltitol says causes laxative effect, I'd stay away from it. <laughs> You know, just, just my <laughs> personal thought on it, you know. I mean, you know, those sorts of warning labels, you know, um, to me, warrant taking a second look. Um, and I also, I grew up in the 70s with the whole aspartum NutraSweet stuff. It's like, oh, it's great for you. Have aspartum, have aspartum. And then, you know, I grew up and they're like, oh, that causes cancer. Oh, we're taking all of that off the market, you know, and this is bad. So now they have all these new things, you know, the maltitol, xylitol, you know, the Splenda. And I'm like, well, give it 20 years and let's see, you know, what what happens because, you know, I've already had that experience from when I was. Uh, Dr. Oz says don't eat any when it's in TOL. So yeah. <laughs> because it will cause you to go to the bath. Yes. <laughs> and you don't know that. Yeah. Unless you, you know, you hear it from somebody else. Yeah. So, well, they do have it on the word, you know, the labels, but but it's always about this big on the side and you know it's it's buried with everything else and so that's why I always encourage people to be a label reader here's the thing we're living longer than we ever have and don't you want that to be as healthy as it can be you know my father-in-law just passed away in, in May but he was 87 and before he passed away you know he was in really good shape you know him and my mother-in-law they were like in their 70s and 80s 
biking 30 miles a day on a vacation trip. You know, you want to be that person. Um, and here's the thing, we can't control much in life. We can't control all of the pollutants and the poisons in the air. We can't control all the pesticides in, you know, the farms and the gardens. We can't control crazy drivers on the road, but you can control what you put in your mouth. That's one of the few things that you can do. And one of the things that they have learned is that there's a huge link between the foods we eat and our health. You know, um, they have so many correlations, um, not necessarily causal relationships, but correlations between the types of food that people eat and the type of health that you have. And so, you know, if you're going to choose choose wisely you know choose things that are going to give you energy that are going to refuel you which are going to give your body you know what it needs to be you know the most healthy that it can be um, now having said that you know that doesn't mean you have to give up your desserts you know because life is about moderation and you know you don't want to go cold turkey and just eat salad for the rest of your lives you know what's the fun in that you know um, and so that's why you know if you get rid of the sugar, if you add the fiber, the protein, then you can indulge in desserts once in a while and feel good about it. So, um, any other questions about sugars? Yes, I, the coconut sugar, yes. does that taste at all like coconut or does it, it just sweet? No, if you, it, it's actually, if you, if you were to just take a bite of it, it's just, you, it kind of tastes crunchy, but you know, you can't really have too much of a flavor that you can identify from it. Um, the thing with the coconut sugar is it acts like brown sugar does in most baked goods. And so you can use it and it won't taste like coconut. Um, what it does do is I have found that it might brown your stuff a little bit more. Um, so often you might end up needing to put like aluminum foil over the top of a cake or something if you don't want to brown quite as much. Um, and what's nice about the coconut sugar though is like they'll tell you on the bottle, you know, one for one replacement. I never do that. I always use like half the amount and it's plenty sweet. You know, so, um, but what's nice about the coconut sugar is you can just use it the way you would regular sugar and you don't need to change anything, you know, if you're not changing anything else, you know, in your baked goods. Because well, for me, because I have so many food allergies, you know, I'm changing everything in my, uh, my baked goods. Um, but for folks who um, are looking, especially if someone mentioned diabetes, that it's very low glycemic. Um, and like I said, if you're cutting it in a half or a quarter, then you're putting a lot less into your, your system, so. Um, yeah, they just, they take the coconut and they distill it down. Yeah, so I think they actually use the juice of the coconut is, is what I think that they do. So, um, um, I think, yeah. Yeah, what's lovely about the world we live in now as opposed to the 70s is you can go into any grocery store and buy all of this stuff. Market Basket, Price Chopper, Stop and Shop, Hannaford, um, ShopRite, um, Shaw's, you know, Trader Joe's, you know, Whole Foods. You know, you can go to any store. And now it used to be for a long time they'd have their own separate section, but now they're even mixed in with, you know, if you go down the sugar aisle, there's the sugar, the white sugar, the brown sugar, and then there's the coconut sugar, and then the stevia, and then the agave, and then the honey, you know, so it's, it's not even like you have to go to a different part of the store anymore. So now the one thing is these products are a little bit more expensive. Um, but what I found is if you go to places like this is at BJ's where it's half the price, you know, but you can get this at the grocery store for like four bucks or you can get this at BJ's for six bucks, you know, so. Um, but the other thing is because you're using so much less of it, I find in the long run the price ends up because, you know, you can buy a 99 cent um, bag of, of sugar, but every cake calls for two and a half cups. So, the, you know, the bag's gone in, you know, a couple of weeks. And so you end up buying another one. So I think in the end, the pricing ends up not being as expensive as people think that it, it might be, so. Um, any other questions about sugar? Oh, yes. Have they identified any negative effects since Florida so I'm far? Um, if they have, I, I'm not aware of it, but I don't often stay up on that type of thing. Um, as I said, you know, my um, personal philosophy is just to sort of 
avoid those types of things as much as possible. My understanding is that Splenda is from a natural product, you know, and that it's it's not um, the same as like the maltitol. Um, but I don't know too much about it, so I just stay away from it. Um, like I said, your best bet is I made these um, pumpkin muffins um, for a writing group I had this morning, and it was pureed pumpkins, and then I put some unsweetened applesauce into it. Um, and then, you know, spices, and everybody couldn't believe there was no sugar in it. I mean, no sugar. Um, it tasted so good because, and that's the other thing too, if you have never not been without sugar, you will be surprised when you go cold turkey with sugar how great a piece of fruit tastes. Like seriously, I've had people who, you know, because what I tell them is if you've never been without sugar, two weeks, that's what you need to go cold turkey because you have to detox. It's like a drug, you know, you have to get it out of your system. So you go 14 days and then after that, they'll have like a, an apple or an orange and they'll be like, oh my gosh, this is so sweet, you know, and it's because sugar sort of dulls your senses. It keeps you from, I mean, a carrot, a carrot is really sweet. You know, um, roasted pumpkin is really sweet. Um, and so things like roasted beets, you want the best chocolate cake you'll ever have in your life? Roast some beets, puree them, and use that as your sweetener? Oh my gosh, you will, because there's something about the beets that enhances that chocolate taste, you will never have a cake that is as good as a beet chocolate cake. Trust me on this. Um, and then it also adds the pretty color, you know, and so, um, but any other questions about sugars? Okay, so um, flour. So here's the thing. If you are trying to just eat healthier, ditch the white flour. White flour is as bad for you as sugar. If you look on the label of white flour, you know how they have, you know, it'll say, you know, um, the um, fiber, protein, um, vitamin A, vitamin D. Like on white flour, everything's zero, zero, zero zero, zero. It's just all zero. You get nothing from white flour. But then you look at calories. <laughs> and under calories, it's not zero. <laughs> it's really high because it's just carbs. And when you have um, white flour, it's the same thing as sugar because when it goes into your system, the carbs just break down into a simple sugar and then you feel lousy. You just feel awful. And so if you just want to eat healthy, whole grains, whole grains, whole grains. And I, you'd be surprised. I've had some friends who the first time they've made um, a cake with whole wheat flour, they're just shocked at how filling a little slice can be. Because they're used to the white flour where you can eat half the cake before you realize that you know, half the cake's gone, you know, um, because there's nothing substantial in it. And I love the nut, or I used to love the nuttiness of whole wheat flour before I developed the crazy allergy um, to it. So all my food allergies for me personally happened after the age of 40. So don't turn 40, stay young. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but, but if you look at whole wheat flour and you read the label, it'll have like five grams of fiber, you know, six grams of protein. Um, and we talked about how having that fiber and protein counters all the sugars that are impacting in your system. Now, some folks, you know, look at me and they're like, I can't go whole wheat, you know, it's, it's just too heavy. Um, now on the market, they have what they call white whole wheat which is basically they take the whole wheat, um, that's the, the um, not the red wheat, but the white wheat, and they process it a little bit more so that it's the consistency of white flour. Um, and that I think has more like three grams of fiber and protein, but that's better than zero, zero, you know? <laughs> so, you know, so if you really can't, you know, go straight to the whole grains, then try the white whole wheat, because then at least you're adding more protein and more fiber, you know, to your diet. And if you're just substituting for that, the only thing I would suggest that you need to know for baking that I've learned is the whole wheat flour is a little bit heavier than the white flour. So what I usually suggest is for every cup of wheat flour that you're substituting for a white flour, take out like a tablespoon. You know, just take out like a tablespoon. Now you all know how you're supposed to do your flour, right? 
Yeah, I know, and that's bad. That, so if you, the way you're supposed to do your flour is if you have a measuring cup, you take a spoon and you just lightly put your flour into your cup and then level it off. And this is what you could do. You can do an experiment at home because most of the time what people do is they take their flour, they scoop it, or they take the bag and they dump it. So if you're a scooper or a dumper, scoop or dump, put it into a bowl, then do it the way I suggest with the spoon, like put it in your bowl, and then you're going to look at your bowl and you're going to realize that you have about three times as much flour in your um, bowl. And that's like inevitably someone goes home, they make one of my recipes and they say it didn't work. It like, you know, it was too heavy. And I say, did you scoop or did you spoon? And they go, uh, I scooped. I'm like, okay, why don't you try spooning it and see what happens. And then all of a sudden the recipe works. Um, because what happens for most people is that they're either scooping or dumping and it is heavy. You know, the flour gets packed down and then you're, you're using way more flour than you're supposed to do for your recipe. And I don't know how many people um, read cooking magazines. If you read cooking magazines, what they've started doing in the last few years is they do it by weight. You'll, it'll say, you know, for your cake, you know, you need whatever, five grams of flour, you know, because they've realized that people were scooping or dumping and using way too much flour. And they'll say, this is about one cup. Um, and so um, it's a way of making sure that you're not using more flour than you're supposed to be. Now, if you're like me, I don't have a scale in my kitchen, you know. Um, I think, you know, they assume that the people who read these cooking magazines are going to go out and buy a scale. So if you're not going to buy a scale like me, then just lightly spoon it in and level it off, and then you won't have any of those, those issues. So um, anybody here mention that they have a gluten allergy? Your granddaughter. So, so cooking gluten-free seems to a lot of people to be this mysterious thing because um, wheat flour has gluten, which allows the cakes to rise, um, which gluten-free flours obviously don't have. But what's nice for our day and age is now they've taken the mystery out. You can just go to the store and buy, you know, um, blends. Because what they've done is the way to make gluten-free flours work like regular flour is they mix different types of gluten-free flours that are heavy, light, and medium with starches like potato starch, arrowroot starch, corn starch. Um, because if you've seen those starches, potato starch, it's really white and really light and if you ever open up a, a container of cornstarch it goes everywhere because it's just so fine and so if they mix that really 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 fine starch with the heavier gluten-free flours then they get sort of the same consistency as wheat flour and it used to be you had to make your own blends but now you can go to the grocery store and King Arthur and Pillsbury you know all of the main um, flour companies now make blends that is just a one-for-one -one substitute. So you could just go to the store, buy a blend, and then just substitute it. So if your granddaughter's coming and you want to make her a cake, just buy, you know, the um, pre-mixed ones and just follow the instructions and your cake will come out just fine. So. And almond flour is nice, but it has a lot of fat in it. So, yeah, almond flour is a very nice flour um, if you don't have a nut allergy, you know, because here's the thing, a lot of people, you know, have combination allergies, and so, um, so for like me, I can't have gluten and I can't have nuts, and so, but if you don't have a nut allergy, almond flour is a nice flour because it's high protein, high fiber, and so, and that's the nice advantage of a lot of the gluten-free flours, is that a lot of like oat flour, I love, you know, like the um, oats on the apples and the oats in the, um, raspberry bars, oat flour has eight to 10 grams of protein, you know, and it has eight to 10 grams of fiber. And so, you know, you can feel good about eating that, you know, um, as, as your breakfast, you know, or in your um, baked goods. And so, um, but almond flour is high too in protein, usually it's about six, 
you know, grams. And so um, if you have no allergies, it's definitely. We use as much, though, because it made, I made some brownies with them, and they made them kind of sticky. So you need to use less because it's, it is a nut. It's fat. Yeah. It's different than white. It has a lot more fat in it, yeah. So. Yeah, so, um, and it's also, it's a heavier flour, and so, um, Alana's Pantry is a blog site that has, a, she uses almond flour a lot, and she has a lot of good recipes that, you know, yeah, it's Alana's Pantry, and so, you know, so, um, she, that's the flour she loves to use, and so, you can find a lot of recipes there if that's the one that you like to use as well. I think it's dot com. I just usually put in Alana's Pantry and it pops up. Okay. You know, she's she's pretty well known. She has a lot of followers. So, um, okay. so, um, but if you um, want to make your own, it's really simple. It's just a matter of going to the store, and then you'll see that the flowers start with the really dark, heavy flowers and go down to the really light, fine starches, and it's just mixing you know, some of the heavy flowers with some of the lighter flowers and with the starches. And sometimes it's useful to do that. I had, um, I don't know how many folks are from a certain generation like me where you remember those ginger snap cookies, yeah. the ones that actually snapped, not like these ginger cookies that they have now, which is just basically like a molasses thick cookie. And those are good too, but I wanted a ginger snap. But of course, I can't have dairy, I can't have nuts, and I can't have gluten. And so I was like, okay, how's this gonna work? So I had to mix and match flowers and experiment until I could find the right ratio so that I could get my snap. So, you know, so if you're like me and you're trying to find, you know, something special, then it's worth making your own um, blends. But if you're just trying to substitute for like a granddaughter or something, just buy the pre-made mixes. And the nice thing is that nowadays you can go to places like Ocean State Job Lot, get them a lot cheaper. You can go online. I had, I remember the best deal ever. I'm a bargain shopper and a good deal will make me happy for weeks. And um, they had online once where three pound bag, this is usually like $11, $2 a bag. So I bought um, 12 bags of sorghum flour and 12 bags of the blend. I, I, I was probably on a high for months, you know, so I was like, you don't get better than $2 a bag. So, you know, definitely go online and, you know, see what sort of deals you can get, what sort of coupons, you know, you can find. Um, any questions about flour and gluten-free? When you, when you buy bread, it, many of them say multi-grain, but that's not necessarily whole grain. No, it has to say, a, no, it actually has to say 100%. If it says just whole wheat or just multi-grain or just whole grain, it's a blend. Only if it says 100% is it. Um, and you have to be careful. You know, we talked about sugars and being label readers. Bread. It's bread. <laughs> and lots of breads on the market have a lot of sugars in them. And it's funny because a lot of people will tell me, oh, you know, I only shop at like Trader Joe's because it's all healthy. Trader Joe's bread has more sugars than the bread you'll find at your regular grocery store that's made by, you know, the regular companies. You have to be a label reader. You know, there's no reason why your toast should have six grams of sugar in one slice. So. I, I went to a uh, seminar on uh, pre-diabetes and they told me not just to look at the total carbs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Don't worry about the sugar. It's supposed to say total carbs, and you're only supposed to have that many carbs. In yep, yeah. But here's the thing, though: is the the total carbs is all of the grain carbs and the sugars yeah. added together. So if you are looking to lower that total carbs, then you want to look for a bread that's 100%, you know, whole grain and has less sugar in it, and then that's what lowers that number. Yeah, so, um, but yeah, any other questions about flowers? Okay, you wanna go to the next thing, Jonathan? How are we doing on time? So, okay. So, eggs. Somebody said they had an egg allergy. No, somebody we know has an allergy. Somebody you know have egg allergies, okay. Eggs are good for you. For a while, they were saying eggs were bad for you. And then they realized, no, eggs aren't bad for you. Eggs are good for you, you know. But the thing about eggs is a lot of people have allergies. And for people who do have to watch their cholesterol, you know, those lovely little yolks which make things so creamy have, you know, 
lots of cholesterol in it. And so, um, so if you're just trying to eat healthier, just use egg whites. It's so easy to substitute for egg whites nowadays because now they sell liquid egg whites at the grocery store, you know, and not egg beaters. Stay away from egg beaters. Egg beaters is actually not just egg whites. It's like egg whites mixed with 80 bazillion things, you know. You want the container that just says 100% liquid egg whites. And a quarter cup of a liquid egg white is the same as a large egg. And so if you're making a cake and it calls for two eggs, just use half a cup of liquid egg whites and you're good. You know, if you're making, um, like I like to make like frittatas and egg bakes and things like that. And I use mostly egg whites and then I put in just one or two eggs just to give it that little bit yellow because it does look kind of funny when it's just albino, you know, <laughs> all white, so, you know. Um, but if you only have a couple of egg yolks, it's a little bit healthier for you. So if you're just trying to eat healthier, just use egg whites, you know. If you have an egg allergy, what's nice is there's so many ways to substitute nowadays. Um, they have on the market, they have egg replacers, which essentially is just like baking soda on steroids. No, that's really what it is, if you know, it's because I have, um, you want to go to the next one, John, then so you can see. Um, so the egg replacer, you don't even have to spend money to buy the ones at the market. You can make your own. You just take baking powder and mix a little bit of starch, like corn starch, arrowroot starch, um, tapioca starch, potato starch, um, a little bit of gum and water, and you've got your own egg replacer. Um, now, folks know the difference between baking powder and baking soda? No. Okay. So baking soda is just the plain leavener, but baking soda needs an acid to react. So how many remember volcanoes that you used to make in science class where you, you know, you take your baking soda and then you add your vinegar and it goes, woo, you know, um, that's because baking soda needs that acid to react. What they discovered was that people don't always have that liquid acid around. You don't always have vinegar in your house. You don't always have lemon juice, you know, orange juice. So they created baking powder, which is um, baking soda, which is the leavener, with cream of tartar, which is a dry acid that's mixed with it. So that's why you'll see if you look at your cake recipes, if you have a cake recipe that calls for baking soda, it'll usually ask you to use something like buttermilk as your liquid ingredient because you need that acid for it to react. If you have a cake that has baking powder, those are the ones that just say use water because it doesn't need anything to, to react with it. it um, and so you have to be careful because a cake that's made with baking soda for a cup of flour, it only needs like a quarter teaspoon of baking soda. But for baking powder, it'll call for a teaspoon of baking powder per cup because it's the baking soda mixed with the cream of tartar and a little bit of salt. You have a recipe that you try with a teaspoon of uh, baking uh, soda. You have to use hot water. And put it in the hot water. Yes, because it helps it to start bubbling. So, yeah. Well, how many of you um, know about the um, Depression era and the war era wacky cakes? Did anybody make wacky cake? I make cake. Yeah. It's a weird recipe. Well, what it is is our lovely ancestors decided that even if there was rationing and there was no sugar and no butter and no eggs, they were still going to make a birthday cake. Um, and so, and they took that chemistry lesson to heart. And so if you have um, a teaspoon of baking soda and you add a tablespoon of vinegar, that will make an egg in your cake. And that's what all those um, wacky cakes are, is it's just flour, oil, um, you know, if it's a chocolate cake, unsweetened cocoa, and then it'll have a little bit of um, sugar, and then it tells you to mix baking soda with vinegar, and that makes a cake, you know. And so, so if as an egg replacer, you can get the egg replacers at the store, you can make your own, you can use one teaspoon of baking soda with a tablespoon of vinegar. You can also ground flaxseed and ground chia seeds. If you take a tablespoon of it and you mix it with three tablespoons of water and let it sit and thicken, that becomes like an egg that you can use as a binder. You can also, if it's just a binder, you can use pureed fru fruits, pureed vegetables, you know, to bind anything that just needs to be a binder. Um, 
And the other thing is um, aquafaba. I don't know if folks eat chickpeas. Um, there's this amazing thing that happens with the chickpea liquid that it acts like an egg. It also acts like heavy cream. It's like the most marvelous thing in nature. It really, it is what it can do. So if you take the chickpea liquid, so like I made this wonderful Moroccan chickpea dish the other day, and I took the liquid from um, the chickpeas and I put it in my mixer with a little bit of cream of tartar and a tiny bit of um, powdered sugar and some unsweetened cocoa, and it made a nice chocolate cream that um, <clears throat> I used as part of a dessert. But you can also use it as an egg. So a quarter cup of the liquid, if you just froth it a little bit with your um, um, fork, it, it's a lovely egg substitute. So I often I'll have parents here who have children with an egg allergy and they'll be like, I can't make French toast. How am I gonna make French toast for my kid? They can't grow up without French toast. And I'm like, oh no, use aquafaba, you know, cause you could just use, and it's, you know, it's the chickpea liquid. Now the caveat is you need to buy the unsalted, unsugar chickpeas, you know, um, because you don't want to be salted and, and sugared. Um, the other thing for anyone, if you know, we have the egg allergy, pureed bananas, pureed tofu and mixed with milk, you can make French toast with it um, just as easily as, as with the, the egg. So, um, so, but the thing that's nice about um, things like the flax seed um, and the chia is that you also then get all those lovely omegas and things like that that are good, you know, um, for your body. So, any questions about eggs and substituting for eggs. Um, in cakes and things like that, you need to make sure that you have the leavener and the binder. So, you know, you want to use something like pureed applesauce to bind or the flaxseed to bind and then use the baking soda and the um, vinegar. And it doesn't have to be vinegar, it could be any acid. So it could be lemon juice, you know, orange juice, lime juice, depending on what you're making. So, any questions about eggs? Okay. So dairy, um, someone said they had a dairy allergy. Yeah, so um, dairy is so easy to substitute now because if you go to the store, you can find any type of milk imaginable. You can get soy milk, almond milk, cashew milk, coconut milk, hemp milk, flax milk, rice milk. I mean, the list goes on, you know, the types of milks that are sold at the store. And you can get it unsweetened, you can get it plain, you can get it vanilla, you can get it chocolate. I saw banana the other day, <laughs> you know. I mean, this is like the wave of the future. You know, how many different types of milks can there be there? And if you're gonna substitute, you just substitute the way you would any milk. You know, if it calls for one cup of regular milk, use one cup of almond milk. You know, one cup of regular milk, one cup of soy milk. The only caveat is rice milk. Rice milk is colored water. It's really, really, really thin. So if rice milk is the only milk you can have and you want to substitute, you need to add like a tablespoon of a flour or a butter, you know, something, or, you know, or, or uh, um, non-dairy yogurt, something that'll thicken it a little bit because it really is just water and you won't have the same consistency. I've heard a lot of people have had trouble with almond milk, myself included. We get bloating, you get a stomachache. I don't know what's in there, but a number well, of people have told me they've tried almond milk and it just does not agree with them, so I don't know what's in there. Well, I mean, one, they could have an allergy, um, and two, you know, almond milk has a lot of fiber, and that's one of the things. We don't eat enough fiber in our society, so a lot of people, when they start adding fiber to their diet, their stomachs don't react too well because they have to get used to having the amount of fiber because a lot of the things we eat don't, just, just don't have a lot of fiber because we're not eating as much fruits and vegetables as we should be. You know, if you eat a lot of fruits and vegetables, then your body's used to dealing with fiber, but if you're not and you suddenly have all that fiber from the almonds, and it also has a lot of fat, too, so which their body could be reacting to as well. Mm -hmm. um, I used to have, drink apple cider vinegar with honey because mm -hmm. it's supposed to be very good for digestion. It's supposed yeah. to be good for arthritis. And a friend of mine just told me that she, her doctor, told her don't do any vinegar because it's very bad for osteoporosis. Have you heard that? 
I do not know about osteoporosis and vinegar. Um, I do know that, you know, um, vinegar is supposed to be good for your body because they found that, well, they found with cancers, there's this whole thing about whether your internal system is more base or more acid, and, you know, um, and cancers tend to not um, like vinegar and so you know so I know a lot of people who take the vinegar to um, help sort of balance their pH in their their body um, I find when I'm sick that I'll put like a table not a table a teaspoon of vinegar with about half a teaspoon of baking soda and a tiny bit of honey with hot water and uh, that helps to alleviate my symptoms you know from a cold so you know I mean I, I'm big into home remedies so um, I don't like to take drugs if I don't have to, so because I have so many food allergies and so many environmental allergies, you know, don't need to add more stuff into my my system. So, um, but the nice thing about dairy, going back to dairy, is that um, you have all the milk substitutes, and you also have the yogurt substitutes because you can get soy yogurts, you can get coconut yogurts um, for. Things like cream cheese and regatta, they make um, soy versions of those. They have like a tofu sour cream, and those can all be used the way you would for a regular um, um, yogurt or a regular sour cream or you know a regular cream cheese. And so, so it's a it's a nice world if you don't have a tofu allergy. Um, which fortunately I don't so um, and I love to use tofu pure tofu um, I didn't make it for for this time um, but I make a chocolate mousse that's tofu it's just tofu and melted chocolate and it is so good and I make it for people all the time and they I think I'm lying to them when I tell them that they're eating tofu. They're like, I don't like tofu. I'm like, well, you like the mousse, you know. Um, and so, you know, it's nice because tofu is protein. And so, you know, the, if you are diabetic, um, I worked out all the um, calories and points and the carbs, and you can have a cup of tofu mousse, and it's only 15 grams of carbs. I mean, that's like a wonderful thing, you know, I mean, to be able to have, because lots of times, you know, if you're diabetic, you know, your wife or your husband gives you a dessert, and it's like a sliver that's this big, because, you know, when they figured out what was between the 15 to 45 grams, which, you know, you're supposed to stay in between, it ended up being a sliver, and you're looking at that, and you feel sad for yourself, you know, it's like, you know, you think, well, you know, it's not even worth eating it, you know, I might as well just go have a piece of lettuce if that's what you're going to give me, you know. And so, you know, I make for company, I'll make the tofu mousse because then I can give them a decent serving and they feel like they're part of the rest of the world, you know. They're eating a decent dessert and they're not having to worry about all those extra carbs. So, um, um, and as I mentioned, the aquafaba that acts as an egg substitute is a wonderful heavy cream substitute. If you put it into a mixer with cream tar of tartar and mix it up, it's like heavy cream. I make like a chocolate mousse pie that I put it on, and again, nobody knows that it's chickpea liquid. You know, they think that it's, it's you know, a heavy cream on top of the mousse pie. And so, so the chickpea liquid, um, I think somebody told me about it, and then I tried it. I make these meringues with it that are, oh, people eat them like popcorn. You know, I make them nice and small, and um, it's, it's a, like I said, it's a marvelous, marvelous invention of God. I don't know what is with this chickpea liquid, but, you know, and as far, and it's funny, you know, they have chemists who have been trying to figure out why it does it, because as far as they know, it's just chickpeas. Like, it's not kidney beans, it's not, you know, like, like cannelli beans, it's only chickpeas, you know. Yes, if you buy raw chickpeas and you boil it yourself, it's the same, the liquid works too. Yeah, so. See, I'm a lazy cook. You know, I, I like to just get my can. And <laughs> 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 burn the chickpeas because it takes so long. Yeah. I go out of the room and I come, you know, and I smell something. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> so, Never like, leave like, the room. <laughs> always have a can in the cupboard just to get yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah, no. Well, and that's the thing, too, you know, um, you know, I have three children, on, and two of them are more grown now, but when they were young, I mean, cans are convenient, you know, and especially if you buy ones that are no sugar, no salt, and it's just, you know, the chickpeas, then, um, you know, it's nice to have them and just pull them out when you want to use them. So, um, so any questions about dairy? 
Is uh, given that you have no allergies, is one type of milk better for you? No, um, if you have no dairy allergies, then you know milk is good for you. But here's the thing: if you need to be careful about fat, then stay away from whole milk. Um, if you have to be careful of your sodium, stay away from fat-free milk. Because fat-free milk, since they took all the fat out of it, they increased the sodium to make it taste good. <laughs> so, you know, so, um, so that's what I tell people, you know, that, you know, depending on what your issues are, you, um, then, you know, 1%, 2%, whole milk, fat-free milk, it depends on, you know, because the thing about milk is that you get the calcium, you get the vitamin D, you know, and it's good for you to have. Now, the problem with milk these days is not actually um, the milk itself, it's all those hormones in it. So so they've been finding that children should be very careful about the amount of milk, the regular milk that they drink, because the hormones that they're putting um, in the cows, I guess, are coming into the milk. And so I was actually talking with someone the other day, her daughter at 10, and I apologize for the men, I don't want to embarrass you, but she started menstruating at 10. 10! Like, I mean, and they, they say it's because of the, the hormones in the milk. So if you have young children, you should be very careful about, you know, how much of the, the milk they're having. Um, and, you know, all the other milks, and really a lot of it, if you have no allergies, you know, having a milk like an almond milk or a cashew milk or a soy milk, what's nice about it is the protein in it. You know, that you can have a glass of milk and have some protein with it. Um, but you do want to be careful about a lot of those milks, too, because they make them sweetened. Like the vanilla milks and things like that have a lot of sugars in them. And so you need to be careful. Um, um, and so if you like the taste of the unsweetened versions, then it's nice to have those and have them um, for the protein. Um, so, or like the flax milks have no protein or fiber, but it's got the omegas, and so, and it's a little bit thicker like regular milk, so some people, and it's a little bit sweeter, so some people like that, so it really becomes a, a taste preference, so, you know, so. Fat! As I talked before, we are a nation of extremes. So either everything is full fat or it's fat free. Stay away from anything that says fat free. Because anything that's fat free, when you go to read the labels, you can't read half the ingredients on it because it's mostly man-made synthetic stuff. Um, and they've actually found so, um, for a while, you know, people were like fat-free dressings, fat-free dressings, and they found that all of those chemicals in the fat-free dressings were preventing nutrients from vegetables being absorbed into your bloodstream. And so they said, don't do fat free, you know, you wanna have regular dressings. Um, and here's the thing about fat, everything in moderation, your body needs fat, your brain needs fat. You know, you need fat as a baby when your brain's developing, and then as you get older, you need the fat. Um, and so you need to have fat, but everything's in moderation, and there's good fats and there's bad fats. So for folks of you who really, really, really love butter, Here's the bad news, bad fat. <laughs> no. um, butter is not good for you. And it's actually, I was reading this fascinating article at the doctor's office about all of those trans fats and saturated fats. It actually, when it goes into your bloodstream, it actually does things to your cells which make it so that all those abnormal cells can multiply and mutate. But if you have a fat that's a good fat, like a plant fat, like olive oil, that the um, monounsaturated, polyunsaturated fats, that those actually repel and actually push away all of those sort of malignant, you know, malformed cells. And so I'm thinking that's what you want. You know, as I said, you want to be as healthy as you can be. And so the nice thing is nowadays there's so many things on the market. So, you know, you can buy Olivio, which is half olive oil and half butter. So you don't have to completely give up your butter, but you can cut down on the bad fats and increase your good fats. Um, if you are willing to completely cut out the butter, um, there are a lot of things on the market um, like Earth Balance and other types which um, have more of the good fats in them than, you know, the bad fats. And they're also helpful for people who have dairy allergies, you know. <laughs> if you can't have butter because of an allergy, then, you know, some of these butters are good for you. The best thing, though, is just to use a plant-based oil. So, for example, I don't know if anyone had the lemon cake um, 
It's good, isn't it? So that, the lemon cake, I used olive oil. You know, it's olive oil. And fats are like what I told you, it's sugar. Any recipe you have for baked good, you can automatically cut the fat in half and it'll be just as, as good. Because what the fat does in a baked good is the fat coats your dry ingredients so that when it's cooking, it doesn't end up being burnt to a crisp. You know, it helps to keep them moist. But you can also, you can do an experiment with this. You know, your cake calls for a cup of butter. Cut it in half to half a cup and mix it with your flour and it's coated just as much as if you had a full cup of butter. You don't need as much butter as they call for in a recipe. And so I automatically, so this, um, I have to actually blog about this, but someone wanted to recreate a lemon bundt cake that her mother used to make. And the recipe called for, it was something like one and one quarter cups of butter and it had like two and a half cups of sugar in it. And it was, of course, you know, three cups of white flour. So the cake that I made, so it's um, um, sorghum flours mixed with some brown rice flour, so a little bit of protein and a little bit of fiber. And I used half a cup of olive oil. And for the sweetener, I used um, a third of cup of the Truvia. <coughs> And um, that's it. So, you know, it's a cake you can feel good about eating because it's not going to, you know, raise your glycemic index the same way. It's got very little fat and it's got the good fats and it's got, you know, a, a flour that has a little bit more protein. And I did use um, egg whites. So you get the protein from the, the eggs, um, but not the cholesterol from the yolks so um, and what does the butter do it breaks the cells, the so, cells up? well the the saturated fats in it and stuff does something and I didn't fully understand all the chemistry in this article at the doctor's office but you know you're sitting at the doctor's office and they have these medical journals for you to read that was my choice that or Sports Illustrated and I didn't want to read Sports Illustrated so you know um, but it's fascinating to think about these things. our bodies are such a marvelous wonder you know the things that it does and how intricately everything is connected um, and as I said the only thing we can control is the food you know what we're putting into our systems and they so many studies have linked foods to everything um, and so we want to eat as healthy as as we can now the thing about um, fats is that we talked about fruits and vegetables, you know, about how they were wonderful binder egg substitutes and wonderful um, sugar substitutes. They're also wonderful fat substitutes. So, you know, a lot of um, fat-free recipes that you'll find on the market, what they do is they take out most of the butter and use something like pureed applesauce, you know, or pureed, you know, pumpkin or, you know, pureed bananas. Um, and so, again, you get the fiber and you get the vitamins and you get the minerals, but you get half the, the fat if you're swapping out. So um, that's also a nice substitute. So, and it's also great if you're making like a gravy. Like I make this Thanksgiving gravy that um, everybody loves, which I use pureed pumpkin instead of butter and flour to thicken it. Um, and then a lot of lovely herbs. Herbs and spices are your friends, you know. Um, and so uh, the only thing about fats that you need to know is butter is a solid. So if you are not going to substitute like a vegan butter and you're going to substitute a liquid ingredient, then you have to do the same thing as what you did with the agave. You need to make sure that your liquid um, and um, dry ingredients are more or less equal but usually it's the same thing that if you use like half a cup of liquid olive oil instead of the butter then I just either decrease my liquid a little bit or increase the um, dry ingredients and usually about a quarter cup is all you need to do. The other thing that's good if you want a, a solid substitute is coconut oil now, coconut oil has a lot of fat in it, but coconut oil has good fats. And so if you use it in moderation, that's a nice substitute for butter. And I actually, I was at one workshop where someone was saying they love to put coconut milk on a piece of toast. 
they said it's really, really good. I haven't tried it myself, only because it just kind of looks funny, you know, the, the, <laughs> the coconut oil looks kind of like shortening just because of, you know, the, the color of it. Um, but that's something that if you wanted to substitute for um, butter, but wanted it to be solid, because coconut oil, even though it says oil, is actually a solid. <laughs> so it's one of those misnomers. So, but, um, so any questions about fat? Yes. With olive oil, mm -hmm. what is related to the virgin, extra virgin? Yeah, a lot of it is how it's processed. And so, um, and so the way it's processed, it'll give you either a heavier olivey taste or a milder one. And so it depends on, um, and the other thing it affects is sort of the burning point. So if, you know, in terms of sauteing something, and so, you know, so. Um, so the extra virgin would have a higher, like, burning point? Yeah, so the way that they process it and stuff. So, so like for the um, lemon cake, I use the extra light olive oil because it's a little bit milder tasting because I didn't want it to overpower. I wanted the lemon to come through. Yeah. And so, you know, so yeah, so a lot of it is the processing. So, so not for desserts or sweets, but I roast a lot of vegetables, so mm -hmm. I use olive oil. So we better off using one of the more expensive, but the extra virgin. It doesn't really matter. It, it depends on, you know, sort of, you know, if you're going to be sautéing and things like that, you know, so. Yeah, roasting, yeah. 400, 400, and you're not supposed to be high to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. But supposedly with olive oil, I thought you're not supposed to go any higher than like if you're doing it on veg, you know, not, it's not mixed in. Yeah, I, I always roast at 500 because then I can get done in 10 minutes, you know, and I told you, I'm a lazy cook. I like things to be fast, easy, efficient, in, out. It's got to taste good and look good, but with the least amount of effort. So 500, put it in, you know, and that's the other thing about fats. Like if you look up a recipe for like roasting vegetables, they'll be like, use like a quarter cup of olive oil. You don't need a quarter cup of olive oil to coat your vegetables. And I cook, literally, I have this big, lovely black roasting pan that's like 11 by 15. And so I'll fill it with vegetables, and I'll use like two teaspoons of olive oil, and it will fully coat all of my vegetables. Um, and so it doesn't really matter, because I do it at 500 all the time with, you know, olive oil and um, no issues, you know. Avocado oil is a lovely oil. I didn't make it for here, but I make this chocolate cake um, sometimes for the workshops, because I usually bake with whatever I have in the house or seasonal, so I wanted to do more like um, apples and, and pumpkin for this one. Um, but I make this chocolate cake. The frosting is just... Um, Enjoy Life allergy friendly chocolate chips and avocado oil. It makes the creamiest, tastiest frosting you'll ever have in your life. And it's nice because the avocado oil is a good fat, you know, um, from the avocados. Um, and I use, you know, like half a cup of it as opposed to like a cup of butter in the frosting, you know, and I don't use any added sugar. It's only whatever sugar's in the the chocolate chips, um, and uh, I love avocado oil, but avocado oil has a very high, like, you know, it'll, it'll go up to, you know, like 500 um, degrees and stuff like that, and so, but that's... Oh, well, oil is very high, it? Yeah, nut oils tend to be too, but I'm allergic to nuts, so I don't, you know, but it'd be lovely if I can have them, but oils are another thing, like the milks, oh, you could tell I love to go to grocery stores. If you go to the grocery stores and you go in the um, oil section, I mean, there's truffle oils and peanut oils and, and um, safflower and, and, you know, grape seed and, I mean, pumpkin seed. I mean, it's like an oil festival, you know. Um, now, they are more expensive, though. But again, if you go to places like Ocean State Job Lot or you look online, you can get them um, a little bit, you know, um, cheaper. And the thing that's nice about um, oils is you don't need a lot, so you can enhance things. So, for example, um, I have a friend who her son is now going to culinary school, and so for a gift, I bought him a little bottle of truffle oil. And he's like, what do I do with this? I said, the next time you make a soup, I said, just put a dash in and you will be surprised by how it enhances the flavor, you know? And so um, just a little bit goes a long, long way, um, and you don't need a lot, so. This is 
probably a little off subject, but since you just mentioned soup, I make um, in the winter a lot of tomato soup because I have a garden and I have yeah. a ton of tomatoes in the freezer. Nice. And the recipe is wonderful, except you know, there's any cream in it, but there's butter. It's basically onions, tomatoes, and butter. What kind of oil would you substitute? Or what I wouldn't substitute an oil. I'd use pureed vegetables. Instead of the butter. Instead of the butter. Vegetables. It's yeah. very tomatoes. It's a very tomato -y. Yeah, it's a very tomatoey soup. So, but you know, most vegetables, if you use like a butternut squash and puree it, it's yeah. not going to change the flavor of your tomato soup at all. And so take it as creaminess. Yeah, if you puree it, if you you know, um, and nowadays you can even buy at the grocery store in the frozen section. They have cooked pureed squash, you know, so so you don't even have to do the work, you know. And you know, I like it to be easy, so you know, it'll be in your freezer, ready for you when you want it. You know? Use the, the um, earth balance. Does that work? Yeah, you could use the earth balance. You could use coconut oil. You know, I mean, if you if you use a liquid plant oil, it's not going to thicken it um, because of the way the regular butter does, you know. So, yeah. Yes, if you use this, but if you're using, you know, like a, a olive oil or something like that, it's not going to, um, because I think, because what the butter does is the butter adds the fat that adds sort of that little bit of, of thickening and creaminess, which is why I said your best substitute is pureed vegetables, you know, or, you know, pureed fruit too, you know, depending on um, um, how you want to enhance your tomato flavor. So. And do you know if I, if I, going back, I know you're saying pure vegetables and I go back to the earth balance. Mm -hmm. If I use the earth balance, could you then, like, with a boiling water bath, I don't know, you might not know this, like, can it process it that way? Can it that way? Because you're not supposed to do that with, with butter. You're not supposed to, like. I don't know. Yeah, I don't, I don't can things, so, um. I wouldn't be able to answer whether that makes a difference or not. Because so, I told you, because I like things easy, so what I do is I take the tomatoes, put them all into the food processor, and puree them all up raw, whole, and then put them in bags by two cups that I freeze. And then I pull it out, and I make my tomato soups, and I make spaghetti sauce and things like that. And so um, it's just... Because I'm lazy, you know. Canning takes a lot of work. I canned once and never did it ever again. So, <laughs> so, so yeah, that might be something that's Googleable. <laughs> <Yeah, no. laughs> so, question. I had a question on if you have any opinion on ghee. Yeah, that's just clarified butter. It just sort of they cook it down to take the fat out of it. So, so well, I mean you're. You're taking out a lot of the, the fat, um, so you know anything that reduces fat is a good thing. Um, how much of the bad fats it gets out, I don't know. You know, um, I, I, it's it's one of those things that um, if it decreases the fat in general, then you're reducing the bad fats just by quantity. So you know. Does it take out the dairy or no? No, it doesn't take out dairy. Yeah, no, because it's still from the cow. <laughs> so, it's yeah, <laughs> so, yeah. It's found in the same as brown butter when you do, right? I mean, the, it's it's a little bit healthier version of it. And so, when you brown the butter, you know, if you do yeah. brown butter and you let it go. Yeah, you yeah you well that's reducing it. So it make it a little healthier. Well, you're reducing the physical amount, so again, you're reducing, you know, a little bit of the, but the amount that you still have still has the bad fats in it. So, I mean, you know, here's the thing. Everything's moderation. You know, moderation. We just are a society that everything is extremes. You know, we have a tendency to eat too much of everything. And so, you know, I mean, if you're going to, I, I'm actually, I'm surprised, like I'll look at the serving you know, size on something, and it'll say, you know, butter, two tablespoons. If you put two tablespoons on your toast, that's a lot of butter, you know? I mean, it's, it's more butter than toast, you know? I mean, um, but a lot of people do it. You know, I've seen people eat bagels, and I'm sh constantly shocked by the amount of butter that they put on a bagel. Like, you should just put enough to just sort of get that flavor. You know, everything's moderation, so. Yeah, thick layer cream cheese. We we just we tend to go to extremes and everything should be moderation. 
So, um, but any other questions about um, fat? <laughs> you mentioned the uh, problem of olive oil and its flavor. We've gone to some cooking classes of the Bullfinch's restaurant. And he oh. likes to use canola oil instead of the olive oil, yeah. so it doesn't impart any flavor to the. Yeah, because canola is a very neutral oil. Yeah, it's very neutral, and that's why it's very popular. So, um, but I know I've read a lot of things. Like, I guess the verdict's out about canola oil. It's kind of funny. They're not sure whether it's a healthy, good fat oil or whether it's a, a bad fat oil, something about the way it cooks up, you know. Um, but it's a plant-based oil. Now here's the thing, vegetable oil, not made from vegetables. Don't use it. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's like, vegetable oil is basically corn oil in disguise um, and corn is a starch. <laughs> Corn is not a vegetable, people. You know? It is a starch. And so, and also corn is, a lot of people have digestive issues because of corn. So, um, so vegetable oil is not a good oil. So you need a plant-based oil like olive oil, um, you know, safflower or sunflower oil, um, grapeseed oil, you know, something that, you know, when you look on the back, it has all the you know, polyunsaturated, monounsaturated, um, not saturated or trans fats, things like that. So, because um, people always ask me, why well, use vegetable oil? Vegetable oil is not made from vegetables. <laughs> so, you know, it's another way they lie to you. <laughs> so, I have a question about the uh, coconut oil because I always thought coconut stuff was very high in saturated fat, yes, but then they say that coconut oil is very healthy. Well, coconut oil, unlike so. Regular butter has really, really bad fats and almost no good fats. Coconut oil has a little bit of bad fats and a whole lot of good fats is basically what they figured out. But again, everything's moderation. You know, don't think, oh, I can have coconut oil, you know. Um, you know, it, it's, but it's, it's got more good fats then the bad fats is what they're figuring out. I mean, a lot of it is, you know, things are always changing because we're learning more. You know, we have more equipment, better knowledge, you know, things that we're learning. And so, you know, as they do more research and they do things, they realize, oh, eggs aren't killing people. Eggs are good for you, <laughs> you know. Um, margarine, bad, <laughs> you know, stay away from it. But for years, it was like, you should have margarine instead of butter. But now they found it because margarine's all fake, all of those, you know, man-made ingredients are making people sick. So if you're going to choose between margarine and butter, have your butter, you know, and just be, you know, moderate about how much butter you're going to have. But if you're going to choose between butter and olive oil, choose olive oil, you know. Um, so, because like a lot of people say, oh, I always cook my eggs in butter. You know, cook it in olive oil, you know. I mean, it tastes lovely, you know, and it's a much healthier fat for you. So, um, so. any other questions about fat? Okay, you can go, Jonathan. Okay, so the last thing is sodium. So if your products that you buy from the store don't have sugar in it, it's got sodium in it. Those are the two preservatives that they use, sugar or salt. And we eat way too much salt. Your body, like fat, needs salt. You need to have it, you know. Um, but it comes naturally in so many things. You don't have to add it to anything, you know, because if you buy any store-bought product, there's gonna have a lot of sodium in it, and you're probably gonna get more than your day supply just from any store-bought product that you have. Um, so, and then it comes naturally in a lot of the foods that, that you eat. So I never cook with salt. If I'm making cakes and stuff, I, it's another thing where like your cake recipe will call for a teaspoon of salt. You can automatically put in a half or a quarter teaspoon and it won't affect your baked product at all. Um, when I'm cooking things, I don't use salt. Instead, I use all the lovely herbs and spices that are out there. I mean, it's another, you know, aisle that if you go to, like it's just from top to bottom, you know, it's just nothing but herbs and spices from all across the world. Um, and so they're wonderful. You know, try dill, you know, try marjoram, try sage, you know, oregano, basil, you know, turmeric, um, coriander, cumin. My, my oldest daughter loves cumin. Everything she cooks, she puts cumin in, you know. I mean, um, there's so many delicious flavors that you can um, experiment with. Try those before you add the salt, 
you know, um, and a lot of fresh herbs. So here's the thing, if you use fresh herbs, you want to add those near the end of your cooking. If you're using dry herbs, you want to use them at the beginning of your cooking so that the flavors can come out. But what's nice, again, you've got to love the Adrian. Now they have those freeze-dried herbs that you can buy, which is the best of both worlds because they're the fresh herbs and they're freeze-dried so you can keep them in your um, pantry like a dried herb. It's like, whoa, you know? I also saw, I bought the other day for the first time, they had these cubes, frozen cubes of like basil and garlic. And I went, oh, I was like, these are wonderful. So I bought a few of those and put them into my freezer and I just pop them out, throw them into your soup, you know, throw them into your spaghetti sauce. Um, so you can get that flavor of the fresh herb without having to keep a potted plant, you know, in your kitchen, which for me, because I have a black thumb, I kill. So, you know, it's, it's nice to have some of these wonderful inventions out there. Um, so that I can use them. But there's so many herbs and spices that you can use that you don't need to have salt. Now here's the thing, if you really, really, really like salt, buy coarse salt. Because if you have like a teaspoon and you take at home and you put a teaspoon of your regular like Morton's fine salt, and then you take a teaspoon and you put some of the coarse salt, you're basically reducing your sodium intake by like 50% um, because the coarser salt's a little bit thicker and so it fills it more, but you still get the same flavor. So often if I do like some sauteing vegetables, I actually would have a, you know, I'll use like half a teaspoon of the coarse salt and just sprinkle it on at the very end and mix it up and you get the same salty flavor, but you get a lot less sodium. So if you want to keep your salt, then at least reduce the amount that you're using by cutting it in your cakes and stuff, and then use like a coarse salt for like your sauteing and cooking and stuff like that, and you'll get a lot less sodium. So, um, so those are the ingredients that I go through. Um, are there questions about any of the things that we talked about? Is there something that you were hoping to learn that you didn't learn? Um, anything about substituting? Yeah. Are any of your recipes online or on your website? Right? Yes, um, most of the recipes, what did I make today? Mm, I think all the recipes except for the um, chocolate pie and the lemon cake are on the blog already, but those, because I just invented those this week, so they haven't gotten up yet. I, I try to blog every few weeks, but life sort of gets in the way, and so, um, but they will be up there. So yeah, if you're ever looking for any of my recipes, you can go ahead and go to pajamaliving.com and you can find them. But my goal is that you should be able to go home and say, oh, great, Grandma M's chocolate cake, I want to make it healthier, and so, um, and um, I can do this, this, and this. And so we actually, let's do a quick test. So what I have here is this is a chocolate cake. So if you just wanted to make it healthier, what substitutions might, might you make? Get rid of the vegetable oil. Okay, get rid of the vegetable oil. And so what type of oil might you use? Canola or safflower. Okay. I always use Wesson because that's a, a lot of my friends use. Now I won't buy that anymore, Wesson oil, because I, I knew it wasn't made from vegetables, but I thought it was a healthier version. Oh, but yeah. But I use mostly canola and safflower. Okay, and, so, and then I heard you say, yep, so you can use a whole wheat flour instead of the white flour, but because a whole wheat flour is a little bit heavier, as I said, for every cup, take out about a tablespoon, you know, to, yeah, so. Um, what? Less salt, too. Yep, you can decrease the salt. Two cups of sugar is a lot of sugar. De Two cups the of sugar. sugar. Yep, you could cut the sugar in half, or you can substitute you know, um, so, you know, you could use like half a cup of agave instead, you know, or, you know, half a cup of um, coconut sugar. Instead of a cup of milk, you could use a substitute like soy or... or, or yes, if you had a food allergy, the dairy allergy, you can use any other type of milk. Mm -hmm. so. Sorry, with the truvia or like the coconut sugar, mm -hmm. d if you, would you take out all of the sugar and just replace it with that or you would... That's a, I don't use any white sugar at all. The only thing I use is um, I, when I make meringues, I use powdered sugar only because there's really nothing else that has that same consistency as powdered sugar, but I use a lot less than what a meringue recipe would call for. So I don't cook with sugar at all. So I would, so if I was making this cake, I would either use half a cup of agave 
or a cup of coconut oil. Um, the thing with the Truvia is the Truvia doesn't cook as well in like cakes and stuff. It's much better for something like the apple crisp or you know the oat bars um, just because of the type of consistency. It's a very fine um, sweetener. This lady in front of me said don't forget the beets, pureed beets instead of the, the sugar. <laughs> yeah, no, you could, this would be an awesome, you know, yeah. the pureed beets could, you could use that for your vegetable oil, for your fat, or you could use it, you know, for your sugar, you know, um, or if you had an egg allergy, you know, you can use it as the binder for the eggs, and um, and that would be adding vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And with the beet cake. Yeah, no, but you don't taste the. It doesn't taste like beets. It just enhances the chocolate flavor. So avocado does the same thing. If you ever want to enhance chocolate, use beets or avocado. There's just something about the combination that just makes chocolate things taste more chocolatey. So could you boil the beets or roast the beets? Roasting, roasting, <clears throat> yeah, roasting is um, the best because it brings out the flavor. But you could also, because as you've already learned, I'm a lazy cook, at the stores now, they have packages of three to four beets that have already been cooked and, and all ready, and you just take them out of the package and puree it. <laughs> it's like you don't have to do any work. They've done all the work. style? Yes, it's usually, I usually, in our, we, I go to Market Basket, it's like where they sell like the tofus and the vegetables and things like that. It's in a refrigerated section. Um, yes. Yeah, in like the little, um, um, not like the door ones, but the flat, yeah, the cases, so. Yeah, I think it's called Mumpy. Yes, you don't have to. Yeah, yeah. So that's messy when you're going to do the beets and the skin is hard to get off. Yeah. It's not. Are you roasting first? Yeah. Okay. But thanks for coming. Um, if you have... Thank you. Yes, if you learned something here and you liked me, then please tell Ryan. Um, because I, I go by word of mouth when the librarians hear that, you know, their patrons enjoyed me, then, you know, they tell other librarians and then um, I get a gig. So, um, and feel free to take some food, you know, for the road, you know, if you do have some food allergies or something that, you know, you want to try. And if you came in late and you didn't try anything, definitely make sure that, that you try something on the way out. So, thanks for coming. Thank you. So.